Hello everybody, welcome to the Voice of Faith. So glad that you stopped by today and you're a part with us. We appreciate that. Have your Bibles this morning. Let's open them please to the book of Hebrews chapter 10. And this church, we love the book of Hebrews. We love this book. Hebrews chapter 10, verse number 38 and 39. <clears throat> Thank you, Lord. Now the just shall live by faith. But if any man draw back, we could say from that life of faith, my soul shall have no pleasure in him. But we are not of them who draw back unto perdition, but of them that believe to the saving of the soul. Now the just shall live by faith. I remember as a little boy, 10, 11, 12 years old, reading my Bible, and I would read this word faith, and I would just stare at it. For a minute, two minutes, I'd look at that word, F-A-I-T-H. And that word just drew me, and I looked at it, and I, I knew at that age I didn't know what faith was, but I had a hunger for it. I wanted to know what it was about. And I said in my own heart, I want to live this way. I want to live by faith. Now, once again, I didn't know what all I was getting into. <laughs> but it just, and every time, I remember those three years just reading my Bible. And every time I'd hit that word, I would stop and look at it. And it, it spoke to me. And I remember just as a kid looking at that verse, and I, I, I remember saying this to myself. I was probably like 11 or 12. I said, this is my future. I don't know what it is yet, but I know that this is my future. Faith and living by faith is my future. We need to stay with faith. We shouldn't go too long without studying faith, and we should never get away from executing the basics of faith. Amen. Amen. In all of the things that we put into our heart, faith should be one of the major crops should be one of the major things that we put in us. I was a teen, middle teens, and my dad came to me one day. He said, Phil, he said, would you do me a favor, son? I said, what's that, dad? He said, I just read this book by this man by the name of Brother Hagen, and it was a big blue book on faith. He said, I read this book, and I can't find anything wrong with it. He said, would you read it and let me know what you think? And I said, sure. So that was the first faith book other than the Bible I had read. And I read it in about two weeks, and I brought it back to my dad. He goes, what do you think? I said, I think he's right on. I can't find anything wrong with it either. <laughs> and so on Sunday mornings, we had watched Jimmy Swaggered before we go to church. And uh, so one day, Dad said, Phil, you need to watch this other guy with me. Who is that? Is this guy's name is Kenneth Copeland. I go, no, no, I, no. No, I'm Jimmy Swaggered. You know, I'm a Pentecostal boy. He said, no, you ought, to, you ought to listen to this. No, no. A couple of weeks went by, and I'd already read the faith book. And Dad says, Phil, watch this with me just one time. I said, all right, just to make you happy. That was the beginning of the rest of my life. <laughs> uh, nothing against Jimmy Swagger, but I never went back to him. I just plugged in with him. <clears throat> now that you're a Christian, there's only one lifestyle that will work for you, and that's the faith lifestyle. Amen. Nothing else is ever going to work. You can tell what God's plan and purpose is for your life by who He's connected you to. I knew 17, listening to Kenneth Copeland, I knew that this is my father in the faith. And I started to listen to Copeland tapes and reading Hagen books, so I cut my teeth on Copenhagen. Right? <laughs> <laughs> but I'm bummed. But you can tell what God's plan and purpose is for your life by who He's connected you to. Okay? The Bible's a big book. There's a lot of things to teach on. But there's some things you'll never hear from me because that's not my area. I'm not called to that. And if I started studying those areas and teaching that, the anointing on me would by degree get less and less and less. Because that's not my calling. I want you to think about what ministries and the people in your life that God's connected you to, 
Why did he do that? Because that's your supply. That's your supply line. That's the area of grace that God has for you. Amen. That's important for somebody to get that. Let's go to 1 Timothy 6, please. 1 Timothy 6. And think about faith as a lifestyle. We are to live by faith. 1 Timothy chapter 6. You can tell what you're called to because you can't get enough of it. Years, decades have gone by and I still cannot get enough on faith. I still can't. All the books, all the tapes, I still cannot get enough because that's the side my bread is buttered on. That's it for me, right there. I cannot get enough. I'm still consumed. I mean, I started listening to Kenneth at 17. At the time of this recording, I'm 58. I still cannot get enough. I know what I'm called to. I know what my purpose is. In fact, speaking of purpose, Wednesday night after the service, the anointing was on me until 3 in the morning. It was at 3 o'clock that I laid down to go to sleep. And so Thursday night, Leanne and I were going to bed, and I said, I can't wait till Sunday. And she said, why? And I said, so that way I can fulfill my purpose. And she paused. She said, I understand that. Hmm. 1 Timothy 6.12, fight the good fight of faith. Oh, Amen. ouch. I want to live by faith, but now fight the good fight of faith? Yep, the lifestyle that we are called to will be challenged. We're going to have opposition. We are going to experience spiritual resistance. Can you say amen and write that at the same time? It's going to be a challenge. You're going to have opposition. You're going to have resistance. The devil, this world, does not want you to live by faith. This whole atmosphere is just filled with fear and unbelief and doubt. And so for you to choose to live by faith, you're going upstream. You're going against the current. And you're going to feel pressure. You're going to feel evil pressure, demonic pressure coming against you when you decide, I'm going to live by faith. But it's the only lifestyle that works and it's the only one that pleases God. Amen. You know, the Bible does not say it's real challenging just real challenging to please God by faith. It didn't say it's challenging. It said it's impossible. God loves everybody. He loves us all the same. But some of His kids please Him more than others. And if you're a parent, you know, <laughs> I love all of them, but I sure like it when they please me. I sure like it when they obey me. I sure like it when they, they don't kick against the pricks and they don't rebel. I like it when they're in the flow, right? Mm -hmm. This lifestyle is going to be challenged. We are in for the fight of our lives. It is a faith fight. What does that mean? It means it's a fight for faith. It's a fight about faith. It is a faith fight. It is a fight for faith. It is a fight about faith. Meaning the devil's going to oppose you in getting faith and he's going to try to muddle your thinking about what faith is. How many here, there are times in your life, and I'm talking to those of us that have been around for decades, you, you feel like and you realize, I'm really still just a beginner. Just a beginner. Been in love with Jesus since I was five. And I'm still just beginning. And you know, that's the truth. It's the truth. I've got some experience. I've got some understanding. But I'm just getting started. I feel like I'm on the first rung of the ladder looking up. <laughs> I'm on the first one. I thank God for that. It's taken 50 years, but I think I'm on the first one. We got a ways to go. <laughs> Hallelujah. But I'm looking forward to it. It's a challenge to live by faith. It is a fight. 
When we decide to live by faith, we're going to experience the enemies that would try and stop us from living by faith. Let me say it to you right off the bat, real simple, faith has enemies. Faith has enemies. And so we're beginning a series today entitled The Enemies of Faith. And we're going to spend the next several weeks looking at the enemies of faith because there are some. There's a challenge to this. I wish that this wasn't true, but it's true in my own life that I've had peak moments in my faith and I've had valley moments in my faith. I've had peak moments and valley. Now, that's not God's will. He wants me to just go straight up, like, you know, just keep going like a skyrocket, just go. But I've had peaks and valleys, peaks and valleys. But I've learned something from that. One of, the, one of the most important things I think that God's ever spoken to me personally about faith is this. He said, son, there's something greater than great faith. And I was like, I don't know that. What could be greater than great faith? Great faith is great. What could be better than that? And the Lord said to me, consistent faith is greater than great faith. Because you can get the same results that great faith does. Consistent faith is greater than great faith. The just shall live by faith, right? Consistent faith will get you the same results as great faith. And so that has helped me to eliminate the peaks and the valleys and be more steady and more consistent. Let's go please to Luke chapter 8 and let's look at the battle where this faith fight is fought. Let's outline where the battle will be fought because when we find out where the battle is fought, it really helps us to understand the nature of faith. Luke chapter 8, and let's begin reading verse number 4. And when much people were gathered together and were come to him out of every city, he spake by a parable. A sower went out to sow his seed, and as he sowed, some fell by the wayside, and it was trodden down, and the fowls of the air devoured it. And some fell upon a rock, and as soon as it was sprung up, it withered away because it lacked moisture. And some fell among thorns, and the thorns sprang up with it and choked it. And other fell on good ground and sprang up and bare fruit a hundredfold. And when he had said these things, he cried, He that hath ears to hear, let him hear. His disciples asked him, saying, What might this parable be? And he said, Unto you it is given to know the mysteries of the kingdom of God, but to others in parables, that seeing they might see, not see, and hearing they might not understand. Now the parable is this, the seed is the word of God. Those by the wayside are they that hear, then cometh the devil and taketh away the word out of their hearts, lest they should believe and be saved. They on the rock are they which when they hear, receive the word with joy, and these have no root which for a while believe, and in time of temptation fall away. And that which fell among thorns are they which when they have heard go forth and are choked with cares and riches and pleasures of this life and bring no fruit to perfection. But that on the good ground are they which in an honest and good heart, having heard the word, keep it and bring forth fruit with patience. Now, hold your place here. Go with me to Romans 10. Please, Romans 10, 17. I know you know the verse, but let's look at it anyway. Romans 10, 17. When you have it, just let me know. Love to hear those pages turn. Okay. What a blessing to hear. Romans 10, 17. Scripture says, So then faith cometh by hearing, and hearing by the Word of God. Okay, go back to Luke 8. I want us to read... Verse 11 through 15 again, and we're going to take W-O-R-D 
and put in faith. Now the parable is this, the faith is the Word of God. Those by the wayside are they that hear, then cometh the devil and taketh away the faith out of their hearts, lest they should believe and be saved. They are on the rock, are they which, when they hear, we could say faith, receive, or there it is, receive the faith with joy. And these have no root, which for a while believe, and in time of temptation fall away. And that which fell among thorns are they which, when they have heard, go forth and are choked with cares, riches, pleasures of this life, bring no fruit to perfection. But that on the good ground are they which in an honest and good heart, having heard the faith, keep it and bring forth fruit unto patient, with patience. We have here four types of soil which represent four types of hearts. Seven billion people on the planet, and when God looks at us, He sees four different types of hearts. These four types of soil represent four types of hearts. Now, here's the sobering thing. Three out of four produce nothing. Three out of four people didn't produce anything at all. That tells me that the majority of people will lose this fight. The majority of people will lose the faith fight. The majority of people will hear the Word of God and produce nothing. That's sobering. This is a serious battle. It is a, it's a battle for life and death. The battle will be fought in people's hearts. There's a lot of teaching right now on the mind, and that's very good, very important. We teach on that here. But I'm telling you, the battle isn't for your mind, it's for your heart. It's for your heart. The faith fight will be fought not in your head, it will be fought in your heart. Because the majority of people will lose this fight, most people will look around at others and think that living a defeated life is normal. That's just the way it is. That's just life. But it's not. The normal Christian life is victorious. Amen. Thank you. The battle will be fought in your heart, not in your mind. Okay? Okay? We read Romans 10, verse 10. Locating where this fight is fought reveals to us the nature of faith and what faith is not. Listen to me very, very carefully. Where the faith fight is fought reveals what faith is. It reveals what faith is not. Faith is not mental Faith is not mental. Faith is not knowledge. Faith is not knowledge. You can have every single person's faith series, every single book, listen and read. Just because you have the knowledge of faith doesn't mean you have faith. Just because you have the knowledge of faith doesn't mean you're living by faith. Now you need, that's where you start, you got to get the information but faith is not mental, faith is not understanding. Faith is not knowledge. Faith is of the heart. It is a spiritual force. Faith is of the heart. It is a spiritual force. When you finish writing that down, go with me please to 2 Corinthians 4, 2 Corinthians 4.13. This is why many people who jumped on the faith bandwagon years ago are not on the bandwagon with us. It's because they thought that the knowledge of faith equaled faith. Hear me. You can have a head full of knowledge about faith and not have it in your heart. You can understand, you can understand faith and still operate in fear. Second Corinthians chapter 4, verse 13. We having the same spirit of faith, according as it is written, I believed and therefore have I spoken. We also believe and therefore speak. 
it didn't say we having the same knowledge of faith. We having the same understanding of faith. Faith is a spirit. We having the same spirit of faith. We have the same spirit of faith that Abraham had, that Joshua had, that Moses had, that Paul had, that Jesus had. When you were born again, the spirit of faith was put into your heart. Amen. That's good news. You have the spirit of faith in your heart when you're born again. But it can stay there dormant and do nothing because Christians are doing that all the time. Once again, the majority of people will lose this faith fight. And part of it is, well, I understand what faith is. Can I give the same illustration again without you being upset with me? When I was in high school, nine months of the book of learning how to drive. And man, I aced the test. I know that car. I know how to drive. I, it's all book knowledge. It's all learning, learning, learning. And then we had a simulator. I went to the simulator. Man, I aced the simulator. It was great. And I thought, I know how to drive. I know how to drive. But when I got in the car with the instructor and he handed me the keys, it's okay, Phil, settle down. <laughs> Having the information of faith and living by faith is two different things. Amen. And you're going to know faith better and the real revelation of faith comes when you're living it not just in the simulator, not just in the book learning. There's a scripture that says in the last days people are going to ever be learning but never come to the knowledge of the truth. Yeah. That's just not for the sinners, it's for Christians too. Yeah. Learning, 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 learning. This convention, that convention, this seminar, that seminar. Learning, 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 learning. What are you going to do? I'm going to go learn. What are you going to do? I'm going to learn about faith. Yeah. What are you going to do after that? I'm going to learn about faith. Yeah. When are you going to step on, out on faith? Uh, let's go back to school. <laughs> let's go back to the simulator. The majority of people, this, I'm not, this just, it hurts me to say this, the majority of people that you know are not living by faith. That's right. So many of my buddies, the man would make a beeline to Texas. We're going to a faith convention. And not one of them is serving the Lord today. They're not even in church. Because they thought the knowledge of faith equaled faith. So you believe from the same part of you that you love with. You believe from the same part of you that you love with. Because faith is not mental, it's spiritual, it's of the heart. Do you see that that's already an enemy? An enemy of faith is not understanding that just because you have the knowledge doesn't mean you have it. Doesn't mean that you're living it. Alright, let's go back please to Luke 8. I'm sorry, I should have told you to hold your place there. Apologize about that. Luke 8. Four types of hearts. Four types of people. Luke 8. Let me say this to you. I'm going to jump ahead for a moment. These four different types of soil are four different heart responses to the Word of God. They are heart responses to the Word of God. You hear the Word of God, there's four different reactions. And that's what these four soils are about. Four types of people, four types of hearts, and how they respond to the Word of God. Alright? So, let's zoom in and let's look at the four types of soil for a moment. Luke 8 and 5. A sower went out to sow his seed... And as he sowed, some fell by the wayside, and it was trodden down, and the fowls of the air devoured it. The first type of soil is trodden down. Trodden down soil. And that's what we're going to be looking at here today, after we get through these four. Trodden down is the first type of soil. Second type of soil, verse 6 and verse 13. And some fell upon a rock, and as soon as it was sprung up, it withered away because it lacked moisture. And then verse 13, they on the rock are they which when they hear receive the word with joy, and these have no root which for a while believe, 
and in time of temptation fall away. The second type of soil is temporary. Temporary. These are people that leave during time of temptation. Trodden down, temporary. Temporary. They leave in time of temptation. I'll tell you a little secret. I've never told you this before, but as a pastor, when people come into the church, I watch to see how people react. And if they're like, oh, yeah, 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 man, and they just immediately bring out the pom-poms, I back off. And on the inside, I just back off. Because typically, they won't last. But people who come in that are quiet, don't say much, they're probably going to be here to stay. Anybody can receive it with joy, but most of those people are temporary. Because when the time of temptation, when the pressure comes, they're out of here. Third type of soil Verse 7 and 14, some fell among thorns, and the thorns sprang up with, with it and choked it. Verse 14, they which fell among thorns are they which when they have heard go forth and are choked with cares and riches and pleasures of this life and bring no fruit to perfection. The third type of soil is thorny. Thorny. Trodden down, temporary, and thorny. These are people's heart responses to the Word of God. Nothing wrong with being excited about the Word. Just get some longevity to you. I'm still excited about the Word, but I've been around since I was five, as far as being born again, living for the Lord. So I've got 50-something years. I've gotten excited, but I've stayed excited. Amen? All right, fourth type of soil, verse 8 and verse 15. Other fell on good ground and sprang up and bare fruit a hundredfold, and when he had said these things, he cried, He that hath ears to hear, let him hear. Verse 15, But that on the good ground are they which in an honest and good heart, having heard the word, keep it, and bring forth fruit with patience. Fourth type of soil is terrific. Terrific. Trodden, temporary, thorny, and terrific. Okay, so I want us to look at this first one about being trodden down. And you can leave. No, don't hold your place on Luke. <laughs> Thank you, Lord. Let me go there too. Luke chapter 8, we're going to hold that. Let's go to 1 Peter chapter 1. 1 Peter 1. First Peter 1 and 23. Trodden down soil. People's hearts trodden down. These people didn't receive anything at all. 1 Peter 1.23 Being born again, not of corruptible seed, but of incorruptible by the word of God, which liveth and abideth forever. So God, the seed of God's word is incorruptible. You cannot corrupt it. You cannot make it decay. You can't taint it in any way. The Word of God, the seed of God's Word is incorruptible. <laughs> All right. The seed, the Lord said this to me many years ago, the seed of my Word is never in question, only the soil of your heart. The seed of my Word is never in question, only the soil of your heart. Why? Because the seed of God's Word cannot fail. It cannot be corrupted. It's going to produce. You know, it, I thought it was interesting. I saw a thing on National Geographic a few years ago that they excavated some tombs and they found some seeds. And they planted those seeds and they grew. Now, they didn't come to full maturity, but there was still enough life in those seeds to produce something. And I thought about the Word of God and how it is full of life and incorruptible, and it will always produce. So we don't have to say, well, what's wrong with God's Word? No, we need to ask what's deal with the soil of our heart, right? So how we respond to the Word of God determines if anything will be produced. I'm going to say that again. That's real important. How we respond to the Word of God determines if anything will be produced. How we respond to the Word of God determines if anything will be produced. 
So our heart's response is going to largely determine if we're going to win the faith fight or lose it. I got a new one for you. Instead of questioning God's word, let's take a soil sample of our heart. Take a soil sample of the heart. Trodden down. What happens when you walk on ground over and over again? It gets hard. It gets hard. Trodden down soil represents a hardened heart. People's hearts get hardened. Let me give you some characteristics of someone who has a hardened heart. They're unthankful. They're full of skepticism. Negativity. Anger. Resentment. Rebellion. Unforgiveness. Envy. Strife. And disobedience. This is a trodden down heart. Their heart is hardened. They're unthankful, ungrateful. They're always full of anger. You know, life is just hard. Life is just hard. You know, life's a blank and then you die. You ever heard that one? Yeah. It's just a blank and then you die. It's a hardened heart. Their heart has been walked on. It's been trodden down. Now, there's two things that cause of someone to have a trodden down heart. One is too much access of the world into them. Mm -hmm. The world getting in through the eyes, the ears, the mouth. Too much access of the world into your life. Even as a Christian, your heart will become hardened because the world's going to walk on it. So we have to guard our heart by guarding our eyes, our ears, and our mouth. Right? And then the other way people have a hardened heart is how their heart responds to the Word. Now you take someone who has a trodden down hard heart, have all these things, and these same people wonder why they don't get results. There's no room for the Word. Their heart's so full of all this other stuff, the Word can't get in there, it just bounces off. The, the, the ground of their heart is so hard when you throw the seed or when you sow the seed, it bounces off. It cannot penetrate. And their big excuse is, you don't know what I've been through. You don't know my story. You don't know my experience. You don't know how my wife left me. And they she took the dog. She took the kids. You, you don't know how they did me wrong. And their excuse is, what's happened to them? And here's the big revelation. What, what you think and how you live on the inside determines what's going to happen to your life on the outside Amen. to a very large degree. Amen. But people think, how come I'm experiencing all this death? But they're thinking death, talking death, and they're experiencing emotional death. If you want the outside to change permanently, you've got to change the inside. Amen. And it starts not with your thoughts, it starts with your heart. Romans 10, 17, we read that. So then faith comes by hearing, hearing by the word of God. It's the only verse of scripture that tells us how faith comes. So check this out. Live by faith. Fight the good fight of faith. Faith comes by hearing. The devil's first attack is going to be against your hearing. For him to steal faith out of you, he's going to attack what you listen to. How does he do that? Well, that sounds strange, no? He gets your ear tuned to this world, to its music, to its talk shows, to the radio shows, all that stuff, and you're listening to the world more than you're listening to the Word. So he's going to attack what you listen to. This is his first volley. This is his first shot, is making sure that you listen more to the world than you do the Word. 
I won't say who. <laughs> Thank you, Lord, for stopping that. <laughs> Many years ago, a person I know uh, had the TV on 24-7, all the time, all the time. And so I was in that person's house, and I turned off the TV, and this person went ballistic. What are you doing? I said, well, I just turned the TV off so we could talk. You turn that back on. Why do they have to have TV on all the time? And I asked her that, and she said this. She said, I like the background noise. But the Spirit of the Lord said something different to me. He said, she wants background noise so that way she won't hear me talking to her heart and dealing with her. She's flooding herself with the noise of the world so she won't listen to what I've got to say to her. Now, I'm not saying that's true of everybody. I'm not saying that. But in her case, that was true. His first attack is your hearing. And if it's not that, if it's not you being pulled away to being in tune to the world, he will get you to hear at a lower level of the word. You know who's the most preached to person in, in, in the church? The person on the back pew. Well, that's, that's good, but that's not for me. Oh, that's good, but that's not for me. And they just keep shoving on back to the guy in the back row who gets most of the word. Oh, so-and-so needed to be here that. They really need to hear that. Yeah, too bad they're not here. They re- oh, that was just right for them. He who has ears to hear, let him hear. He's not talking about the flaps on your head. Are you hearing it for somebody else or are you hearing it for yourself? I never said that. Thank you, Lord. He's going to attack your hearing. Romans 10, 17, faith comes by hearing, hearing by the word of God. We cannot overstate the importance of hearing. You just cannot overstate the importance of hearing God's word. Let's go back to Luke, please. Luke 8. Is it possible to hear good anointed teaching and preaching and it get no results? Yes. Yes. Nobody taught better than Jesus. And the masses missed it. Masses walked away offended, hurt, upset. They didn't hear what he had to say. And they sat there and listened to the master himself. Most anointed ever. The Bible says no man ever spake like this man. So you can sit under good anointed teaching and preaching and have no results whatsoever. So it's not just the preacher, it's how do we hear? How do we hear? So the first volley of the enemy, right here, it wipes out most people. Luke 8, 5, the sower went out to sow his seed, and as he sowed, some fell by the wayside. It was trodden down, and the fowls of the air devoured it. Verse 12, those by the wayside are they that hear. Then cometh the devil and taketh away the word out of their hearts, lest they should believe and be saved. I don't know if I said this or not, but the, all four types of people had one thing in common. They all heard the word. All of them heard the word. Jesus never in this parable addressed the person who didn't hear God's word. So all four types of people, they heard the word, but it was their heart response. Trodden down tells you a lot. You do not step or walk on things that are precious to you. You do not step or walk on things that are precious to you. Everybody in your, everybody here, I know, in your own home, you've got things that are precious to you. They're valuable. It may be something as simple as a doily your daughter made you in the fourth grade. That's precious to you. I can guarantee you don't throw that doily down and walk on it. We don't walk on things that are precious. We hold them up high and we guard them. We protect them. Right? Okay, well, read with me, please, in Hebrews chapter 10. Hebrews 10, 28, 29. Hebrews 10, 28, Scripture says to us, 
He that despised Moses' law died without mercy under two or three witnesses. Of how much sore punishment, suppose ye, shall he be thought worthy who hath trodden underfoot the Son of God and hath counted the blood of the covenant wherewith he was sanctified an unholy thing and hath done despite unto the Spirit of grace. How would you trodden underfoot the Son of God? How do you walk on Jesus? How do you walk on His blood and say, it's no big deal, it's unholy. How do you grieve the Spirit of grace? How do you walk on Him? By, by treating the gospel with contempt. By despising, thinking little of the Word of God. People don't think Jesus and the Word as one. But how you treat the Bible is how you treat Jesus. When people think, well, it's not that big of a deal. I don't need to go to church all that much. You don't take all that much. I don't need to read my Bible today. I don't got, you know. When you treat this word lightly, the word despise means to think lightly of. No big deal. This is how people trodden underfoot the Son of God. How you treat His Word is how you treat Him. That's strong, isn't it? I, I am amazed at the generation we live in. How flippant they are about authority. Not honoring their elders and respecting people. It's, it's just like all-out rebellion against any established authority. You know... To hell with this, to hell with that. And church and God, nah, that's a crutch. That's for weak people. That's for, that's for women and old men who need a crutch. That's despising. And they have no concept that they're walking on the Son of God. I just want that to set for a moment. I want that to be heavy. Okay. What is the proper response to God speaking to you? What is the proper heart response to the Word of God? You should be in awe. You should be in awe. You should feel so blessed and privileged that God would speak to you. You should feel that way about the, word, the written Word of God. You should be in awe of the Bible because it is just as much a manifestation of God as Jesus and the Holy Ghost. You should be in awe, reverence. One of the things I don't like to do, I don't like to put things on top of my Bible. I don't like to put books on it. I don't like to put paper on it. I just want to treat the Word of God with respect. So all my books go underneath, but the Bible's on top. My Bible has, I got books, I have Bibles. They have their own special shelf. They're not just with a bunch of other books. Honor, respect the Word. We should be in awe. People literally died so you and I could have this book. My, one of my heroes, 19-year-old boy, died because he wouldn't change one word in the book of Psalms. One word. They strung him up to a post. They beat him and said, this is your last chance, boy. Change that word. He said, no. They lit the fire. How many teenagers do you know would die for one word of this book? What a privilege that God would speak to us. Amen? You should treasure what He says to you. The more familiar you are with the Bible, the more familiar you will be with His voice. The more familiar you are with the Bible, the more familiar you are with His voice. I can say it to you like this. Get to know His Word, get to know His voice. Get to know His Word, get to know His voice. God doesn't speak to me. You need to get in the Word. You need to get in the Word. Because God is only going to speak Scripture to you. I was, you know, young and full of zeal. And I was praying, oh, Jesus, speak. Oh, Jesus, come to me. Jesus, just reveal yourself. Jesus. And I'm on my knees praying. Oh, Jesus, please, 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 Jesus, please, please. Jesus, just come show yourself. Jesus, come, come, please. Come talk to me. Come talk to me. Come talk to me. Oh, I just was after it. Oh, please, please, please. You know I love you. Come on, come on, come on, come on. 
putting all the pressure I could on it. And then when I sputtered out a gas <laughs> and got quiet, the Lord spoke to me in my heart. And He said this to me, if I came to you and granted you your request, all I would say to you is what's written in my word. <laughs> oh, I think I'll read my Bible. <laughs> He said, all I would do is quote you scripture. So just read the book. Amen. Get to know his word. Get to know him, right? Our last scripture today is found in Matthew 7. Faith is not of the head, it is of the heart. It's the same place that you love with. There's a scripture that talks about plowing up your heart and sowing seeds of righteousness. Oh, yeah, Lord. You know. <clears throat> there, are, there are going to be people in heaven, Christians. And they will say, Lord, I didn't have a lot of knowledge of your word because of circumstances, maybe third world, whatever. They didn't have access to the Bible. I saw a video about four months ago. It made me cry. They, they had this video. They showed people bringing in boxes of Bibles to people who had never had a Bible. And they literally were running. And they tore up that big box. And I saw people grabbing Bibles and holding it up against their chest, crying. Adults, 30 and 40 years old. And you th they were just clinging to it and crying. I lost it. Where was I at? What was I? Matthew 7. Something else I was saying. Okay. Yes, thank you. Yes, thank you. Plowing up the field of your heart and planting seeds of righteousness. There are people that are going to be in heaven who won't have had a lot of information, but they kept their heart right. They kept their heart pure from envy and strife and all the junk and God will reward them for what's in their heart even though their head they didn't have a lot of information God would rather you be poor and have a pure heart than have a lot of money and strife and jealousy in your heart he would rather you be sick as to have hatred in your heart He's looking at our heart. Matthew 7, verse 6. Give not that which is holy unto the dogs, neither cast ye your pearls before swine, lest they trample them under their feet and turn again and rend you. So we know that we are not to walk on things that are precious. We don't walk on precious seed. We don't walk on things that are precious to us. And we know from this scripture that we do not give things that are precious to us to people who do not appreciate them. We know that. We've learned, we know we're adults to guard our heart. There are certain things we only share with people that we know we can trust and people that love us, right? Yeah. Things that are precious to us, we don't just tell everybody. I want you to know God is the same way. The reason why God doesn't speak to a lot of people is because they won't appreciate it. They won't value it. They won't treasure it. God is not going to take His deep things and reveal it to people and they think, well, that's no big deal. Yeah, that's, that's nice. Thank you, Lord. He only reveals His good stuff to people that will treasure them in their heart, value them, and live by them. It's all a matter of the heart. It's a hard, it's a hard issue. Amen? Did you get anything out of this? Good, good. So fighting the good fight of faith is of the heart. It's not of the head. Amen? One more time. You can have all kinds of information about faith, but not be living it. Because it's determined by your heart. Thank you so much for listening today and being a part of the voice of faith. We appreciate it. Until next time, we gather around the good word of God. Remember these words. Be not afraid, only believe.